This is an E. This is an F. Fine. But what about this one? Is it a sharp E or a flat F or maybe something more? In today's video, I would like to introduce a topic that hopefully will tie together notes, harmony, timber, 12 tone equal temperament, the number of notes and uh, many other things. So let's start. First of all, we must ask ourselves what a note is. So generally speaking, a note is a sound with a specific pitch that we use to make music. And this is the first important disclaimer. Notes do not exist in nature. They are just a mean that we found to source the sound and organize them in a meaningful system. We partially introduced this topic on this other video here. But the point is that we as human beings need to divide our complex reality into discrete units to understand it better and to communicate it with each other. Think about colors. We can have the red and we can have the yellow and we can also have the orange in between. But where is the point at which the red becomes orange? The same is true for the gray scale. At which point the white becomes gray? And so let's take our previous example. At which point do the E become F? Both sound and colors are waves with different lengths. And here's the second disclaimer. It is easier for us to perceive the notes and the colors in relation to one another rather than by themselves. So if we see two white panels, one after another with a short pause in between, we might think that they are the same color. Just like if we hear those two notes, one after another. But if we see or hear them one straight after the other or even one on top of the other, we can clearly appreciate the difference. If you are familiar with other musical traditions than the Western one, you might already know that the notes sometimes aren't 12, there might be more, there might be less. So is there a reason behind those numbers? The answer is yes, and the reason has to do with maths and with the sound waves that we've been talking about. So the sound in nature comes from vibrating bodies. And according to the shape and size and material of those bodies, when they vibrate, they set up different patterns of motions all at the same time. And such patterns may or may not be in a mathematical relation. When those patterns set also the surrounding air into motion, they make it vibrate in a way that excites our ears and allows us to perceive them as pitch and timber. So the main vibration is what defines a sound's pitch. And the other smaller vibration that go along with that, the other smaller patterns of motion, contribute to its timber. Those smaller patterns of motion have their frequencies and they are called overtones. The overtones are part of every sound in nature, except for the sine wave, which has no overtones besides the fundamental frequency. But the sine wave is an electronic sound, so it doesn't quite exist in nature. So the statement stays valid. So the whole group of frequencies that make the timber of a sound are part of its spectrum. This image here is called the spectrogram. The horizontal axis shows the development of a sound over time. The vertical axis shows the range of frequencies that a human can perceive. Lower frequencies at the bottom, higher frequencies at the top. Brighter color shows that a given frequency is more present in the sound. This image shows a series of notes played on the violin. Every line corresponds to an overtone and you can clearly see that they get progressively quieter as they depart from the fundamental frequency. So one may ask, can I create virtually every timber just by stacking up infinite sine waves? And the answer is yes to a point. The answer has to do with Fourier analysis and additive synthesis, which is quite beyond the scope of this video, but we will get very close to that by the end. But now let's go back to our perception and we were talking about timber. We tend to define the timber of a sound as harmonic versus inharmonic. The distinction may sound quite subjective and based only on taste. For example, a harmonic sound might be a pleasant sound and a inharmonic sound an unpleasant one. Like a flute can be a harmonic sound and a frying pan falling from the stairs can be inharmonic. But on the contrary, the distinction is very logical and very objective. The overtones of a harmonic sound are integer multiples of its fundamental frequencies. So multiplication by 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and so on. And they are all easy, nice, round numbers. The waveform of a harmonic sound is thus called periodic because every overtone begins and ends together with the fundamental tone. 
as showed by this graph. The integer overtones, those that follow uh, integer number progression, are those called harmonics. We must follow two different naming conventions for harmonics and overtones. So for example, if we talk about overtones, we have the fundamental, and then the first frequency is the first overtone, and the second one is the second overtone, and so on. If we talk about harmonics, on the other hand, we have the first harmonic, which is the fundamental, and then the second, and the third, and the fourth, and so on according to the integer number they refer to. An inharmonic sound, on the other hand, has overtones that are not integer multiples of the fundamental frequency, and they create an aperiodic waveform, or a waveform whose overtones don't begin and end at the same time. Just like integer overtones are called harmonics, non-integer overtones are often called inharmonic partials. They can be found in sounds like percussions or bells. The most inharmonic sound is the noise, and especially the white noise, that has overtones all over the place. It virtually contains every frequency, and it is so aperiodic that it doesn't even have a waveform and thus a discernible pitch. In the real world, there is a blurred line between harmonic and inharmonic sounds, and even the most perfectly tuned instruments have a degree of inharmonic overtones generated by their bodies, and they contribute to their timbre. In the electronic domain, however, it is possible to create waveforms that are composed exclusively by harmonic overtones. The most common ones are the sine wave that we already mentioned, but also the triangle wave, the sawtooth wave, and the square wave. The funny thing about electronic waveforms is that the purest they are, the least exciting they sound. Prenso has two oscillators that can generate these basic waveforms simultaneously. If you're interested in knowing how, let me know in the comments below and we might shoot another video. But for now, let us compare them, starting from the sine wave. As we said, this is the purest waveform with only one harmonic and it is so pure that it doesn't even exist in nature. Slightly richer is the triangle wave. which in its mathematical abstraction only contains the odd harmonics, so the fundamental, the third harmonic, the fifth, and so on. The amplitude of the higher harmonics is exponentially lower, according to their harmonic number. So, for example, if the whole waveform has an amplitude of 1, the third harmonic will have an amplitude of 1 third to the second power, so 1 ninth, the fifth harmonic would have an amplitude of one-fifth to the second power, and so on. The square wave has the same harmonics of the triangle wave, but check out how it's different. We perceive it much louder. It's because it has the same harmonics of the triangle wave, but with different intensity. The amplitude decreases in a linear fashion, not exponential, like the triangle. So the third harmonic would have an amplitude of one-third, the fifth of one-fifth, the seventh of one-seventh. And so they are much louder and they contribute to a more uh, in-your-face timbre. And uh, the sawtooth is the harmonically richer waveform available. It contains all the harmonics and still in a linear proportion. And these are the easiest waveforms that we can create in the analog domain. The simplest waveforms like the sine and the triangle can be made more interesting through modulation, like frequency modulation that we can do on the brain. So, and the more complex waveforms like the square and the sawtooth are so rich in harmonics that can often be made more interesting by removing some of them. So, for example, this is a low-pass filter that removes the higher overtones. This is a high-pass filter, and it retains the higher overtones and removes the frequency starting from the fundamental. And a filter capable of doing both techniques is the bandpass filter. But the cool thing is that if we have a very narrow and precise bandpass filter, we might even be able to single out the overtones that build our sawtooth. Let's try. 
Now, Kunsas bandpass filters are quite generous because their slope is 12 dB per octave, but we can create a steeper bandpass filter by tuning all the four filters to the same frequency and routing one into another in series with a gentle Q setting. So, right now I am duplicating the sawtooth wave through the 333. One copy goes to one channel of this uh, QSC and the other one goes into the Kunsa and out of the Kunsa into this channel here. And I set the channel in crossfade mode so we can move from the sawtooth to the super filtered one. And uh, I obtained a very narrow filtering window by feeding every filter's bandpass output to the following filter input. So we have the sawtooth which is entering filter 1 and then filter 1's output goes into filter 2 inputs, filter 2 output into filter 3 input, 3 into 4, 4 into the CGM. Every filter has more or less the same Q setting, quite high so that we can have a very steep window and now we are able to hear the fundamental frequency, which is very low right now, but I'm using a, a voltage offset from a 3-to-1 patch to Kunsa's uh, volt per octave input to move the four filters at the same time. And this, first overtone, And you can hear that we are like scanning the overtones. I'm gonna put that in stereo. And if I replace my sawtooth with a square wave, You can hear that we have wider jumps because the only the odd harmonics are present and we are lacking the even ones. Let's set it in stereo and do another sweep. So by now it should be clear that timber and frequency are two intertwined concepts. So if two or more sounds play together with a specific ratio and even specific timbers, we might not perceive them as a chord, but rather as part of a single timber. This is the concept of additive synthesis and before that of organs. In the analog world, additive synthesis is quite complex and inefficient because it requires a generator for each partial we want to sum to generate our timber. And if we want to be precise, we also would need control over its phase. And in the physical world, it's even worse because if you think about an organ, it's often as big as the church. However, it could be nice to try it out with a few sine waves. Two from the Brenso and four from the Kunsa. This is the first sine wave. Let's bring in the second one. One octave higher. It already sounds like a single timbre. And let's bring in the Kunsa. So, third sine wave. Fourth. Fifth. And sixth. And by playing with the balance of those overtones, we can create a very complex timber. And each individual partial is a sine wave. So if we listen only to that, we would perceive our melody as transposed. But if 
we blend them together, the magic happens. Six sine waves at precise harmonic ratios can be perceived as a single sound. So let's try to bring those frequencies that make our partials, that our harmonic overtones, and try to squeeze them into a single octave. So we will divide them until they fit on the same octave as the fundamental, and we will see what happens. If we transpose the overtones to the same octave, the third harmonic and its multiple are the fifth, and uh, the fifth harmonic is the major third, and the seventh harmonic is the dominant seven. So if we put them to the same octave, we no longer perceive them as part of a single timber, but as part of a chord. It's the dominant seventh chord, which is the key and the foundation of Western tonal harmony. Whenever we play a chord on an instrument, let's say a piano, we play more notes at the same time. But we generate only one waveform, a very complex one, that we are able to discern into different components. If you are even just slightly familiar with Western harmony, you might know that consonant and dissonant are also concepts that are applied to chords. I find quite fascinating the fact that we can apply more or less the same concepts of harmonic and inharmonic sounds at the microscopic level of the timbre and at the macroscopic level of harmony. At the beginning of this video we introduced some questions that are still unanswered, like what is a note and why different cultures have different notes and so on. But we are getting close to that. From now on, this video series will take two strands, one microscopic that will keep exploring the waveforms and the other one macroscopic that will explore the relationship between different nodes. If you have any question or any topic that you would like to explore, let me know in the comments below. I hope you found this video useful and I will see you next time.